Good morning, everyone. And in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 37 through 40, we read this familiar event that happened um, uh, on Palm Sunday, as we now call it, as Jesus was nearing Jerusalem. It reads, Then as Jesus was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you, that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. It's the natural impulse, the duty and responsibility of the created to praise their creator when they're in his presence. He is indeed here today with us. Let's stand, all creatures of our God and King.
Charlie, I'm sure all of you know by now, is going to have to have surgery, probably more than one. So uh, Donnie will be back there with a the basket this morning. Those of you who are watching the service from home, uh, if you want to send a love offering, you may do that. Just send it to the church, and uh, Deborah will make sure that it uh, that it gets to Cody and, and Hannah. So uh, Donnie will be back there this morning for those of you who may not have been here last Sunday or maybe uh, if you weren't prepared to um, make a love offering last Sunday, you'll have an opportunity today. Thank you very much. This coming Wednesday night, we begin our choir practice back, and uh, if you'd like to be a part of the choir, you just come on, and we'll find your book and place to sit, and those kind of things. It'd be good to have uh, Amaro back with us this morning. Uh, she's uh, quit gallivanting around, and she's back with us now. You know, it's good to have her back, and, and it's good to get the prospect, have the prospect of choir again this coming Wednesday night, and we just kind of get rolling. Did you want to say anything about that one? Amen. Amen. So uh, right after prayer meeting this Wednesday night, we have I'm making this promise. We have a great big crowd for prayer meeting. I'll cut the prayer meeting lesson short. We'll have prayer, a part of practice. If you know someone who's not a part of our church but would like to sing in the choir, that's more than appropriate for them to come as well. Prayer meeting begins at six, and choir practice will begin right after that, around quarter to six. Excuse me, quarter to seven or, or seven o'clock, something like that. So remind those folks, and some folks are not able to be here on Sunday, but you probably need to come and, and practice with the choir there. We're in the middle of our Annie Armstrong offering. We have $1,200 in hand, and our goal is $1,500. There are envelopes in the pew that look just like this. You can find one of these and pray about what you'd like to give to home missions. All this money stays right here in the United States. And it goes to help with things like colleges and seminaries and starting new churches and things like that. I can give you a full list, but um, that would be quite a list. So anyway, you can pray about what you'd like to give there. By way of prayer, uh, we need to pray for Charlie. Uh, Brenda has already mentioned him. He's doing very well, gaining weight. Um, and we're, like I said last week, we're praying that he'll, uh, that the Lord will take some of our weight away and maybe give it to Charlie. And, uh, but he is doing very well and making good progress there, so that's good, so we continue to pray. Uh, I um, came into the sanctuary, not the sanctuary, but the hallway a few minutes ago from Sunday school, uh, my class based down the fellowship hall. And as I walked down the hall, I heard this boom, 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 overhead. And I said, man, that's a great sound. So if you hear thump, thump, thumping up there, that means that our kids are back up there and they're thumping around during church and Sunday school. And it's a great thing to have thumping going around in your church. And so we're, we're moving forward in that and we praise God for that. That's a praise report there. We want to pray for our nation. We want to ask God to help us to turn back to Him. I'm, I'm afraid that as a nation, as a people, we have turned away from and God will forgive, and he will renew, and he can, he does. He sent revivals in our great nation a number of times, and he can do it again. That's what I'm praying for. But then I'm also praying for us here this morning, not only right here in the building, but for those of you that are streaming with us today, we pray that God would meet you at the point of your need, that God would guide you if you're kind of confused and lost, God would open up your eyes and help you see things perhaps that you haven't seen in a long, long time, give you insights. That's what Henry Blackley said. Henry Blackley said that when you get a new insight into the way God works, that's the Holy Spirit at work. Sometimes God works by convicting us and telling us, you've been wrong here. And then sometimes he does the opposite of that, and that is saying, you're right on the right track. Hang in there. You're on the right track. So we want to ask the Lord to come and meet with us here, meet with us streaming this morning. We're two or three gathered in my name. I'm there. And so those that are streaming this morning are with us. They're just not with us personally yet. So we want to pray that the Lord would meet with us, guide us, correct us, turn the light on when we need the light to be turned on. Sometimes we need comfort. We're hurt. For one reason or another, sometimes we're hurt when we need to be. And sometimes we're hurt when we don't need to be. We just get our feelings hurt. 
But God can comfort in all the above, and we need to ask that he would do all of those things for us today. Father, we thank you for being here. We know we're two or three gathered here there, so we know that you're here. But Father, because we're blind, and sometimes we can't hear good enough spiritually, we don't hear your voice, we don't see your presence, and so we pray that you open our eyes, maybe open our ears, and God, help us in our hearts to be better people, to be more faithful disciples of yours as we leave this place this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Indeed, Jesus is here with us as we worship. Let's stand and continue our worship to him as we sing Jesus' name above all names. Be of sin, God. 
start getting back to normal and to see all of our church programs kind of gear, gear up again and just get going in the natural mode of service. And um, one of those, of course, is our music program, and that was especially hit hard. We just basically had to shut down the choir. But we're gradually feeling more comfortable with, with communal gatherings of various sorts and singing and, and close quarters. And so we're ready to start that again. And so we welcome all to come on Wednesday nights. We're going to get back to our normal uh, Wednesday night rehearsals right after prayer meeting, as Brother Jerry said, at least by 7 o'clock for a week morning. And then hopefully very soon have the choir back up here in the choir loft and we'll send on occasion for morning worship services. But I'm particularly am, uh, um, pleased and uh, grateful to those soloists and small group uh, ensemble singers who've uh, helped to fill in the role of the choir during this year of pandemic uh, um, um, alterations to our normal way of doing things. Not the least of those is Brother Don, and he's going to sing again for us today, present some special music. Brother Don, come on, come on up. We're glad to see you, uh, both of you here today. And uh, thank you for preparing this. I'll let you introduce your Oh, oh, oh. 
she would usually say, it was usually a woman <coughs> because only women are smart enough to learn math, but anyway, <laughs> she would put it on the board and she would say, you have everything you need. And I would think to myself, says who? <laughs> I have everything I need. But, uh, and, and they would even teach us in, in school, I'm not even sure, I'm not sure, sure they do this, they said, take your paper and we'll get it from the side and then you'll get it. And so I'm, that didn't know, that never worked for me, but there's a point in which if you look at a problem like that long enough, you'll get it. And so, uh, so it is with the scripture. The Holy Spirit turns the light on so we can get basically what's there. In chapter 14, verse 6, it says, I'm the way. And the implication is the truth, I am the truth. The, the I am is not there, but the recipient of that verb is there. I am the way, I am the truth, and then I am the life for next week. So we want to start with Pilate's question. Pilate said to Jesus at the trial, I think this is John 18. I know it's in John, but I'm not sure if it's 18. He said, uh, what is truth? That was Pilate's question. You have to ask yourself, is he a bit um, jaded? Is he one of those guys that just, you know, has heard it again and again and again and just doesn't make any sense? Perhaps he was influenced by the Greek culture in which he lived. This is Rome, and the Greeks were about their thing. You have um, Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato who were somewhere near that. They were not the same age or the same year, but they were the same. Uh, and so he, the Greek, Romans were influenced by the Greek culture. That is uh, my point there. So maybe you've heard a bunch of Greek philosophy all along the way. And you know, philosophy is an interesting thing. I enjoy, frankly, I enjoy reading philosophy, but it's good for, I don't know, just about nothing. But I enjoy reading that. Uh, we used to have this little question. I don't know if you've ever heard this or not. If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there, does it still make Sound. Well, that's an interesting question, and we could spend all day on that if we wanted to. I frankly don't care. For me, it makes a sound whether there's anyone there or not. That's the truth. But you can ponder over that question, and if that helps you sleep at night, just go ahead and ponder. But it doesn't help me at all. It doesn't help me with the truth at all. So Pilate wondered about that. I think Pilate was like us. Pilate lived in a world. The world is still confused today. Um, we have um, been granted the uh, gift of the philosophy of relativity nowadays. So everything is relative. There is really no right and there's no wrong. Uh, in this situation something would be wrong. In this situation something be, would be right. I remember uh, on that relativity thing, I remember talking to a friend of mine who was a custodian several years ago, and I heard that he and his wife were getting a divorce, and I said, oh, you should, I started calling his name, but I'm glad I did I said, oh, you should uh, not get a divorce, blah, 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 you want me to talk to her? And he said, yeah, I want you to talk to her. He said it just like that. So I got on the phone, and an hour later, I thought to myself, he needs to get a divorce. <laughs> Um, had a seminary friend who um, had a 
mom's teeth? And I said, is your wife and no? And how did you tell? You know, they were very happily married, really fine folks. I said, did you tell? He said, well, I, um, he said, I, sh I showed her on the, the honeymoon. And I thought to myself, what a time to let your, your wife know that you have false teeth. And I said, what did you do? He said, I just popped them out. He popped them out. <laughs> Satan 
said to Eve, though, seem to be correct. And it's, it's usually got that seem to be feel to it when Satan tells you something. What Satan says to us seems to be logical. It seems to somehow or another make sense. But I would remind you that he's a counterfeit. A counterfeiter is, or a counterfeit is something that uh, poses as real. And, and Mark mentioned Satan as an angel of light. He's not a monster. He doesn't have horns. And he's not red. And, you know, have fire and all those things. He's an angel of light. He looks like the good guys. He deceives. He deceives by taking truth and twisting it. Our definition of marriage in our culture now has been subtly twisted. Um, the definition of the word perversion is to take something good and just twist it just a little bit. And that's all you have to do. He uh, deceives us with half-truth and perhaps with in, uh, an incomplete truth. Satan confuses us. He puts a cloud just enough to over us to discard, uh, to, to uh, obs obscure the truth. Excuse me, I'm looking for that word. So the truth versus a multitude of Truths. We used to have this saying, yeah, but a hundred years from now, what will it matter? I'll tell you what it will matter. The same God will be on the throne a hundred years from now. Amen. And if it's true today, it will always be true. When I get to heaven one of these days, if it's true here, it's going to be true there because Jesus has taught us the truth. Relativity says it's just how we perceive it. And there are differences in perception. Um, I forget what I'm, where I was. I don't know. I was on Cox Creek a few weeks back. And I passed by this sign. This is male perception versus female perception. And there's this sign that says Anna's Nails. N-A-I-L-S. Anna's Nails. And I'm thinking, oh, I didn't know she sold, you know, nails. <laughs> you know what that is? That's a male perspective. Where she was, you know, the sign was about Anna's Nails. Fingernails and thumbnails and that kind of thing. And so... That's a difference there. There can be twisted truth. For example, we mentioned this already about sexuality and all kinds of sexuality of some or another truth. There's half truth. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's like a half truth would be um, if you're, you, you get your insurance adjuster to come look at your car and, you know, he's been in a wreck and he said, well, the defenders look fine. Yeah, but the bumper is falling off. Well, the fenders look fine. You know. Half truth would be to say that's true, and certainly is true. We emphasize this, believe out that, and we can do the same thing with Scripture. I'm afraid very often in church we're guilty of emphasizing these Scriptures and leaving out the totality of the Scriptures. The totality of the Scriptures are sometimes a bit confusing because they appear to conflict from time to time, and so it requires... Wisdom, it requires a broader standard of truth than sometimes we bring to it. And I'm bringing back to that same thing. This is in the Bible. It says, there is a way that seems right. Or if we want to substitute a word, we could say, there's a way that seems true. But the end thereof uh, uh, is destruction. So we come to the truth. And that would be the Lord Jesus, of course. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. By true... We mean a number of things. There are certain nuances to the word true. First of all, when I say true, I think we mean together. We mean there's a right and there's a wrong, and Jesus is telling us the right thing. Morally right is probably the spiritual end of that. Uh, and then we mean something that's accurate. But in passing, there is historical truth that some people throw out there. There's scientific truth that some people throw out there. There's medical truth. There's spiritual truth. But I would point out that when it comes to historical truth and medical truth and scientific truth, experts, whatever that means, disagree on all those truths. We've been through a year when each day as we turn on our television, we listen to different medical truths from different persons. In fact, what one person said on Monday might not be the very same thing that that very same person says on Tuesday. And so it's hard to find the truth like that. 
there is psychological truth that I didn't even put on our list here. Not too many years ago, I used to be, um, I used to fashion myself to be, someday be a counselor, uh, spend quite some time. But, but when I went to college, it was um, all the rage to do prefrontal lobotomies on people. That is where they do a surgery to separate one part of your brain from another. That was considered psychological science in those days. We don't do that anymore. Why? Because we learn, first of all, that it doesn't work, and number two, it's just absolutely unnecessary. The psychologists tell us that, um, that man is best, basically good, but the Bible tells us that he is not. If he's really good, then I don't know, what about Adolf Hitler? Well, that, that doesn't sound real good. What about Osama bin Laden? That doesn't sound real good. Saddam Hussein, I'll just throw a few names out here for you. The Unabomber, some of you are old enough to remember that. The Boston Bomber, most of us are old enough to remember the Boston Bomber. That's not good. Jeffrey Dahmer, remember him? Let's not even talk about him. Bring him up here. What about the mass shootings this very week? Two different occasions in the last 10 days, right? Does that mean that man is basically good and somehow or another just kind of got... Oh, I know. These people just don't like themselves. Is that what the problem is? What about 9-11? What does that say about mankind? Well, then, well, if you go back further in history, what about Pearl Harbor? The same type of a thing. So the, the whole idea, we get this from psychologists nowadays, and, and it's inaccurate. That's my point. It's inaccurate. It's inaccurate that man is basically good. The Bible teaches us that man is desperately wicked. His heart is wicked. Jesus says, men love darkness rather than light. Now that's the truth. We do the wrong thing often simply because we want to. Maybe it makes us feel good somehow or another. Maybe it makes us feel so secure, but we basically want to do these things. Now when mankind was created, and if you get to real technical, when mankind was created, he was created good. He turned back by an act of his will, by his own free will. He chose to do the wrong thing, even knowing the right thing. So truth might mean accurate. And when you come to some issues, you know, the Bible um, is historically true, it's scientifically true, but that's not its main focus. Its main focus is on spiritual truth, which affects everything else. And so it's historically uh, and spiritually accurate. And then, when we say the word true, we mean it's genuine, sincere, pure. It's pure truth. It is dependable truth. And a definition of dependable, genuine, the real deal truth would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's always going to give us the truth, he's dependable. I can depend on him to do uh, the right thing or tell me the right thing as well. So... And having said that, we, it gets, it's even more complicated. We have positive and negative truth. Positive truth would be heaven. Here's, this, you get this from the scripture, right? It tells us about heaven. The negative side of that is hell, which are true. And the correct answer is both are true. If you've got a negative truth, that would be hell. If you've got a positive truth, that would be heaven. The negative truth is, you and I are sinful. Positive truth is God can and will forgive us. There's painful truth and comforting truth. You are a sinner. You do wrong. You've already done wrong today. You didn't do wrong because you just slipped up. Sometimes we do wrong because we want to, because we like it. Is any here besides me that likes to do wrong? Well, not one of you. Actually, painful truth and comforting truth. We like to sin, but Jesus forgives us. There's partial truth. There's angels throughout the book, this book. But the other side of that is there are demons throughout this book too. The partial truth would be that there's just the angels and not the demons, but there it is. It's in the scripture. It's the word of God. Uh, Peter was a leader of the apostles. And um, we like to talk about him being the leader in the 
Catholic Church even says that he's the leader of the Catholic Church, I, I think. I'm not a Catholic person. So I don't, I don't close to know that. But I do know this. There's another side of Peter. The same Peter, who was such a leader of the apostles, is also the Peter who denied Jesus. That's the non-positive truth. That is the complete truth about him. And when you take it together, even though Peter was extraordinarily disloyal, I'm not really sure there's anybody in the Bible who is any more disloyal than Peter was, but if you take it together, yes, he was a sinner. Yes, he was wrong. Yes, he did the wrong thing. But the other side of that is Jesus found him and forgave him, even as bad as he was. There's some examples of some truth uh, that I'd like to throw at you. Um, the first one is um, success and failure. Um, when you succeed, in our mind, you have a lot of money. When you succeed, in our mind, in our culture's mind, you have a lot of esteem. The, the, the lie, though, would be in the middle of success and failure is, is that I'll be happy if I have a lot of money. But, and people couldn't line up and tell you that's just not true. That's an example of false truth. At church, um, we think that if we have big numbers at church, we'll be happy. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, this is, and this is Jesus, I love what. Jesus said, the narrow way and wide way, and few that will be that find the mark the narrow way. Few. So we think that it's just all about numbers. Jesus taught there's going to be few that will find that narrow way. In the book of Proverbs, it says this, and this is one of my favorite Old Testament Proverbs. It says, the race doesn't always go to the fastest. I like that. You know why? Because it's true. The race does not always go to the fastest person. Sometimes the per slow person wins. So there's some always in the in the word of God. God's word will always be in sync with the Bible. The truth will be in sync with the Bible and with Jesus, of course. By principle and the and the words that Jesus said and the principles that he taught and practice the way he lived. The truth always <coughs> will always win over falsehood and error in the end. Just like light always dispels the darkness, the truth will always win. Now it may take a while. It may be beyond your lifetime before the truth comes out. It may be at the very end of all life the truth will come out. But it's going to come out and in the end it always wins. And not only that, you can trust those who tell you the truth uh, all along. Um, I read the story several years ago of a guy by the, by the um, sorry to call his name, I guess not. But anyway, he was uh, convicted of a crime and was taken to prison. And they asked him at the very end, they said, um, um, what happened? He said, well, this R.G. Lee tells the story. He said uh, he was about to go to the lecture chair. But all along, I always knew God ran the whole show. All along, I always knew God ran the whole show. We don't see the whole show. But one of these days, we'll all see the whole show. And we'll all know. And we'll see the truth. And we'll know what the truth is. And bottom line is Jesus is the truth. He can be depended on. You can trust him because he's always going to give you the truth. Sometimes it's a painful truth. The complete truth that perhaps you've never heard before. But it's what we need. And as we own up to the fact that we need to be convicted of our sins, we need to ask him to forgive us. Then we can be forgiven, that's the other side of that. And when we're forgiven, we're free. If you don't confess, you won't be forgiven. You won't be free. So we need to repent of our sins and ask Him to forgive us. And then He can free us. Free us. That's the truth. Father, I pray for grace to do just that today. To come to you and see how that we messed up and follow you. 
do the right thing. I ask God that your uh, grace would be more than sufficient for us, that we see it, that we know it, and that we own it as the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Will you stand? God bless you to make the decision. If you come right now and make that decision, follow him in the best way that you know how. Sometimes we say in our minds or in our hearts, I don't know what to say to God. Great. Words are empty and shallow anyway. Just come as you are and say, I messed up. And I'm coming to say to God, I messed up and I want, I need his forgiveness in my life. I need another chance. And God will. Number 379, 379. Thank you.